Well, today we're continuing in our series, Surprised by Jesus. Now, as you know, we have worked systematically through the book of Mark, but I threw you a curveball last week. I skipped over the first 11 verses of chapter uh, 11, and then I, I did uh, verses 15 through 19 right in the middle, and it's like, well, what about 12 through 14? Well, the reason I did that is because the, the passage today um, entitled The Fig Tree, Faith, and Forgiveness actually is brackets the passage from last week. Last week we saw Jesus go into the Temple Mount, that greater area, and he cleansed the temple. And he was upset because they were selling in the court of the Gentiles. And he said, my father's house shall be a house of prayer for all nations, and you have made it into a den of thieves and robbers. And that was the passage that we looked at last week. God's heart for the nations for all ethnic people, all ethnic groups. Him wanting to see people from all, every nation and tribe coming to Christ. And so therefore, at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, for the people of Israel, there was set aside a court of the Gentiles so that non-Jewish people had a place to go and pray. Well, today's passage, we're going to be looking at the brackets, what took place before Jesus went to the Temple Mount and what took place after Jesus went to the Temple Mount. And those are thematically linked through what took place with a fig tree. Well, this is very dear to me personally. Now, some of you may have known that my father was the son of a sharecropper. And so he grew up dirt poor. And he left home when he was 14 to, to, to go and continue his high school education. And after serving in the Army and then in the Navy, he got his education and, and became a physical therapist. So he left the, the, the sharecropper situation, but some of that agrarian base carried over with my dad. When I was growing up, my brother and I, we had to push a manual plow. I mean, an old style steel wheeled plow. And it took both of us to, to push that sucker. And so we had a garden and we were growing vegetables. And dad, he was always trying to experiment with things. So we had some, some peach trees out back and we had a pecan tree out back. He was fascinated with gardening and plants. So in addition to the fruit trees, he, he had his hand at, at growing a grapevine. And so he had a little grape arbor on one section. But then he also had some other things. He had a fig tree. And so fig trees, this whole illustration is very real to me because I know a fig tree. It's a very porous type of wood. And so in Virginia, it's not the ideal climate for fig trees, but Dad, he wanted to grow stuff. So what he did is he mulched around that fig tree, and we had this fence around the fig tree with mulch piled up so that it wouldn't freeze in the winter. And you know something? That fig tree produced fruit. And we had some good figs. Very poor. She couldn't climb on the fig tree because it was fragile, so I learned about fig trees. But my dad was also, he had some crazy ideas. He wanted to grow bananas in Virginia. He did. And so he, he found out about this variety of banana tree that could survive. So what he did is he planted it, and then it would grow, and then he would dig it up in the winter, wrap it up, and then he would put it under our house in the crawl space so it wouldn't freeze in the winter. And he said that if I do this for seven years, they say that it will eventually produce bananas. And so I remember that we would, he would dig it up and we'd wrap it, and that thing got pretty honking big, but he would take it and we'd feed it under the house. Well, the thing is, is that that banana tree never produced bananas. He did it for seven years faithfully. But he cared about these, these interesting things. And so I don't know if you've ever had something where you wanted to see some results and you put a lot of effort in and you never saw it work out the way that you wanted to. My dad lived that out, and, and I had the uh, opportunity to watch that. But we see an interesting story about God wanting and having an expectation from fruit. And we see a very unusual situation. And once again, we are surprised by Jesus and his encounter with this fig tree that we're going to read about in these passages. But the main idea that I want you to take away today, the main idea that takes this story of a fig tree in, on the road from Bethany to Jerusalem back 2,000 years ago, and it makes it relevant for us today. And the reason we need to pay attention to this text today is because the fruit we bear reveals the health of our being. The fruit that we bear in our own life reveals the health of our being in this whole situation of Jesus in the parable and in the situation with the fig tree highlights that for us today. As I said, this story is the bookends of the message from last week about the purpose of the temple. So as we read the story today, 
The first point that we need to understand is that the, the story of the fig tree is not about the figs. It's not about the figs. It's about the figure. Follow along in your Bibles or, or your devices or read along as we read the passage of verses 12 through 14 um, in uh, uh, Mark chapter 11. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, this is where Jesus was staying because he, he stayed in Bethany and he walked into Jerusalem. Um, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, this is a really troublesome passage, because what we see here is the behavior of Jesus which doesn't match anything that we've ever seen in how he's operated. It gives the appearance that Jesus is self-serving and capricious and cursing a fig tree because it didn't have any figs on it, and it wasn't even the season for figs. And so this could be a very problem. As a matter of fact, people who are hostile to the gospel and hostile to Jesus point to this passage of saying, look, who is this Jesus? Is he really this sinless person that you say is? What kind of behavior is this for a Messiah? But we have to understand that it's not about the figs. You see, this was an object lesson. This was an, an, an acted parable that Jesus was living out. You see, Jesus, he to, told parables sometimes. And he would tell a story about some event that was taking place to make a point. Other times, Jesus spoke about situation using real people's names and real life stories. Well, here is a real life event that's taking place, but Jesus is using this as an enacted parable. It's not about the fact that there, there was, he was, didn't get the food that he wanted to eat from the fig tree, but he's using this situation with this fig tree to illustrate a more important point and truth. So he uses this real situation where he curses a fig tree and a fig tree dies, but it wasn't a capricious impetuous type of action. It was intentional to show a deeper spiritual truth. He used this figure. He used this image. You see, Jesus went and he saw this, this fig tree in the distance, and he saw that it was in leaf. And having grown up around fig trees, I know this process. They have these big, beautiful leaves and this, 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 these branches which are kind of porous, but when the leaves start to come out, there's also a little bit of a bud that flowers at that, at that fig tree. Now, the thing is, is that those buds are not the fruit in and of themselves, but they're the beginnings of the fruit. So you can theoretically take those and pinch those off and, and eat them. But what's going to happen is those little flowering points will eventually grow into the figs as well. And so Jesus goes and he sees this, this fig tree in leaf and he inspects it. And it's interesting because there are a couple of commentators that have two views of this. One saying it was ridiculous for him to look for anything because it wasn't the season. But others are saying he was looking for the buds. Maybe to, to, to pinch off a bud because it could be used for nutrition. But Jesus inspects the fig tree. And what he discovers is that the fig tree that is in leaf does not have any buds as well. And so Jesus knows that this tree will never bear fruit. If there are no buds, if there are no flowers, you cannot expect fruit to come forth when the time of figs comes. So Jesus, he examines the tree. He inspects it. But you see, the, the fig tree here is not about figs. The fig tree is an illustration and an image of the nation Israel. Remember where he is going. You have to look back to the message of last week. Jesus is going now to Jerusalem. He's going to the Temple Mount and he's going to address the fact that the temple was there to be a house of prayer for all of the nations. The reason that Israel was set apart was so that they could be a light to the Gentiles. They could be a light to the nation so that people wouldn't have to live in the bad way of false religion, to sacrifice their children to Moloch, to invo be involved in all sorts of idolatry and immorality. Israel was set aside to be a light of the truth, of the true and living God who transforms people's lives, who doesn't allow them to remain in bondage and slavery to false religion. Israel was set apart so that they could be a light for truth and hope to all the nations. But yet, 
Jesus goes to Jerusalem and sees that the court of the Gentiles is filled with commerceants. Um, what's the word in English? Merchants. Sorry, I get a little French that gets in my brain that sometimes I can't even speak my mother language. Um, but there were merchants there, and they were not using it as a house of prayer the way that it needed to be. So Jesus is looking to this, this fig tree as an example of Israel. Israel failed to fulfill their purpose to bear fruit, to be a light to the nations so that people could come to know the true and living God. And they had perverted their purpose of being a people set apart so that truth could be proclaimed and they became something totally different. You see, a fig tree and leaf is a promise without fulfillment. You know, it's easy for somebody to say that I'll do something and then they don't do it. And you look back and they say, well, they, they could have done something if they had tried and they don't do it. Or they might have done something if they tried and would have been willing to do that. You see, there's potential for fruitfulness all along the way. But if they choose not to do something, if they don't do something and they never do anything, that potential was wasted. And Jesus is looking at, at the fig tree and he's seeing the life of Israel played out. They have the leaf. They had the potential to bear fruit, but they aren't bearing fruit. And so they're not fulfilling their purpose. And it's better if they were cut down and not taking up space. There's the problem of a promise without fulfillment. And there's also the lesson of the fig tree is the profession without practice. We see Jesus constantly talking about a tree being known by its fruit. He said a good tree this is going to bear good fruit. A bad tree brings forth bad fruit. So he's in the process of inspecting the fruit. And here's a tree that should have been bringing forth good fruit, and they have the potential to bring forth nothing. See, there's the object lesson of the fruit tree, but it highlights the fact that fruit is the expectation. He said in verse 14, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. You see, there was probably said, there was a time when it bore fruit. He said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. It implies that it may have borne fruit at one time, but it's no longer bearing fruit. It's no longer fulfilling its purpose. And that's a problem. We were designed to bear fruit in season and out of season. I think of the Apostle Paul when he spoke to his main disciple, Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, he says, I charge you in the presence of, of God in Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, repu re reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. You see, Paul exhorts Timothy in season and out of season to be bearing fruit, being ready to preach the gospel. And that's a message for us today. In this world, there's so much pressure to, to give a message which sounds good and makes people feel good, but yet it's leading them in a way that leads to death. They're so easy to give a teaching that makes people feel good and, and, and satisfies the itching ears, but it's not based in truth that transforms. And so we're tempted to compromise and staying true to the gospel because sometimes it's, it's hard and sometimes it's tough. And sometimes it's uncomfortable. But Paul says, be ready, Timothy, to preach in season and out of season. And Jesus is expecting this tree to be bearing fruit. Even though it's not the season for fruit, there's going to be a time that comes when it would bear fruit and should bear fruit. But there's nothing there for which to bring forth fruit. The thing is, is there may have been in our own lives, we may have borne fruit in the past. And that's good. And if you've been fruitful in the past, congratulations. I am so happy that you had the joy of bearing fruit. But the thing here is we can't count on past fruitfulness. 
God wants us to experience fruitfulness continually in our lives. And yes, there might be seasons when we need to be growing roots and then bringing forth a bud, but there needs to be fruit that's continually coming forth in our lives. So we can't count on the fact that, you know, one time in our life we bore a lot of fruit. We were producing a lot of fruit, but we haven't borne fruit in one year, two years, five years, ten years, twenty years, but we bore fruit way back when. You see, God wants us to experience the joy of the harvest continually. He wants us to be developing His people so that we can cultivate fruit. He said, by this, people will know that you are my disciples, that you bear much fruit, and that fruit remains. You see, fruit is the expectation because fruit is our purpose. And it's not just because He wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to experience the joy of bearing fruit. And that fruit comes from abiding with Jesus. So if we're not currently bearing fruit, we should be preparing to bear fruit. And that brings us to a tough question that we have to ask ourselves. Are you bearing fruit, the character fruit of holiness in your life? Are you bearing fruit of conversion, seeing people that don't know Jesus coming to know Jesus? Have you ever borne fruit? Often this can be an indication of of where we are in our own spiritual health because the fruit we bear reveals the health of our being. And that's not to say that it's going to look the same way for everybody. A person who has the gift of evangelism is going to see, you know, tens and hundreds of people coming to Christ. And a person that has the gift of service might not see tons of people coming to Christ. But whatever your gift is, whatever your call is, we need to be in the process of bearing character, fruit, and transformation so that we're conforming to the image of Christ. And we need to be involved in the process individually and corporately of leading others to Jesus. Because that's our purpose. That's why we're taking up space on this planet and breathing the air so that we may bring glory to our Heavenly Father by seeing others come into the kingdom. I appreciate what Alonzo said earlier about being received as a friend, but he's not a friend here anymore. Alonzo's family. He's my brother. And we want to gather in others into the family from all nations, races, and tribes, and tongues, like we saw last week when Jesus was up on Temple Mountain saying, my house shall be a house of prayer for all of the nations. That's an exciting thing to see the family of God and the diversity and beauty of God's people coming together because of the uniting blood of Jesus Christ. This is something that I can get excited about, if you can't tell. It's something that gets us excited because we have that purpose and we have a call in our lives. You know, I think of the whole seasonal process in Israel and they had the feast that they would go go through. And there would be early spring and there could be the certain fruits that would come forth in the early spring. And then there would be later uh, season of spring where different types of fruit would come forth. And then there would be early harvest and late harvest. And sometimes you could get several crops that would take place. If you had an early planting season, you could have a later planting season. And so the thing is, what are we doing to maximize our fruitfulness? You know, some people can say, well, guess what? I want to bear fruit all year round, even in the winter. Impossible, right? No, you just build a greenhouse. So there's the possibility of continual fruitfulness. It just means thinking ahead and doing what you can so that you can bear those fruits in season and out of season. You can have tomatoes in February if you have a greenhouse. Exciting concept. May that be our case spiritually. Let us be either preparing or bearing fruit. The purpose of Jesus cursing the fig tree highlights the deeper teaching beyond the illustration. And it's all about the second point, finding a flourishing faith. You see, Jesus wants the people of Israel to find a flourishing faith. And he wants us to find a flourishing faith in our experiencing. Picking up with the other side of the bracket now, verse 20 says, As they passed by in the morning, they saw the tree, uh, the fig tree, withered away at its root. Remember, Jesus went up to the Temple Mount. They came back, and then on the way back, they discovered that the tree that was cursed in the morning has withered away at its root. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered him, saying, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, 
and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So here we see that the importance of finding that flourishing faith. It's focusing on, on Father God and the character of the one who is our provider. Back in the day, there was a song called Jehovah Jireh, and it went, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. Now, the thing is, is Jehovah Jireh, God is our provider, and we look at the character of God who provides as the, when we focus our prayer. It's not about us, it's about the one who provides for us, and that is what creates a flourishing faith. It's about having the proper focus. Now, in this illustration that we see with what's taking place with the return trip from Jerusalem, they find this withered tree. And it's interesting to note that it could be, this tree could either be rotten or it could be rooted. And we see that when they saw the tree, Peter said, Look, Rabbi, the fig tree that you curse is withered. And it would, had, the tree had withered away to its roots. Now, the issue was, more that it, than it was something superficial about not having fruit, this tree was withered completely. It wasn't just a dried branch that had the scorching heat of the day. It was withered to the root. The root re reveals that the lack of the fruitfulness showed a more serious problem. When Jesus cursed it because it wasn't bearing fruit, it was never going to bear fruit. And his cursing of it just was the fulfillment of what was normally going to take place with it. There was a problem with the structure. There was a problem with both the flawed structure of the, the, the fig tree itself and the nutritional delivery system because it was withered to the root. From the root it could not draw the nutrients from the ground to deliver it to the, the branch so that it could bear fruit. This, this tree was completely worthless. You know it's, it's interesting to, to see how often we focus in on the superficial and ignore the more serious structural problems. We might say, well, we're not bearing fruit now, but there's fruit's going to come. But the reality is fruit will never come because we're not intimate in our relationship with God. We're not pursuing Christ in holiness. We're not preparing ourselves and developing the structure to be strong so that we can bear fruit. And we just look at these superficial things. It's easy to look at superficial things like church attendance or even daily reading of Scripture. Not that those are bad things, those are good things. But if we are not having a heart to pursue Christ with all of our being, a superficial reading of Scripture or a weekly attendance of the church isn't going to address these systemic problems that will hinder our fruitfulness in the long term. So let's look at those deeper issues and address those flawed structures, because otherwise it will result in a feeble faith, a flawed, superficial, non-submitted, and unbiblical faith. We don't want to have a faith that is in name only, but we want to have a faith that is in transformational in power. We read about this in James chapter 2, verse 19. James says, in addressing a problem of the nature of faith, says, you believe in, that God is one and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You see, James recognizes that the demons believe that Jesus is Lord. As a matter of fact, they, when, when Jesus would confront people that were, were demonized, the demons would cry out, oh, have mercy on me, son of God. They recognize that Jesus is Lord. They believe that he is all-powerful. The, the issue is not with the intellectual belief. The issue was the willing submission to his authority. And so they have faith in Jesus, but it's just not that biblical saving faith. And so the question is, are we living with a heady faith that isn't a transformational faith? And see, if we don't have that transformational faith, then we don't have a biblical faith. And if we don't have a biblical faith, there is no way that we can ever bear fruit for God's glory. And that's why it's important to evaluate and examine ourselves. Not to become so introspective where we become incapacitated by contemplating our own navel of saying, what's wrong with me? But saying, is there a systemic problem and am I addressing that? And that's why when Alonzo was talking about the bridge of the cross, 
We have to know where we are in relationship to Christ. Have we put our trust in Christ and crossed over from death to life by receiving Christ into our hearts by faith, putting our whole trust in Him, putting our whole weight in Him for salvation? This is the illustration of the fig tree. Are we having the faith that's going to produce fruit that shows the type of tree that we really are? So in addition to being rooted or rotten, we also have to look at the, the lie that I call of the, the name it and claim it, the prosperity gospel. This name it and claim it type of gospel is really spiritual abuse and it often comes from this passage which is taken and perverted, where Jesus answered them says, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up, thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you receive it, and it will be yours. Now, it's important that I highlight the perversion that is often taught with regards to this passage. It's that lie of the name it and claim it. The, the lie goes like this. I have faith in God. Therefore, I can ask for anything that I want and He'll give it to me. You see, that's the flaw. It's not asking for anything, but having faith in God is important. It isn't vital, but it's not asking for anything. See, a, a prayer of faith is a prayer of saying, Lord, lift up this mountain. Remove this difficulty. It's not faith in faith, it's faith in the God who is able to move the mountains. So it's not asking for anything. It's looking to the one who has the ability to do anything. And that can become a perversion. And then they'll take that phrase of, uh, well, if I have faith and I don't doubt, then anything will take place. The word for doubt in the Greek is diarenko, and that's talking about doubting or hesitancy. And so they say, therefore, whatever I ask for, if I don't doubt, then God will give it to me. And that's the second part of the lie, of the name it and claim it. Versus we need to be asking the God who is able to do anything for guidance in what we should do. And if we are willing, if we ask him to give us guidance, then we have to be willing to obey the guidance that he directs. So it's not saying, give me whatever I want, but guide me in the way that I should go. And if I'm willing to obey, then we know that he is able to do whatever he wants to accomplish in our lives. It's important to understand these things because if we don't, then it leads to two distortions. And the distortions can result in spiritual abuse. And the first one is if, if I don't get it, if I don't get what I asked for, I ask for everything, then I lack faith and it leads to discouragement. And then it leads to self-condemnation. I asked God to heal me and I just didn't have enough faith, so therefore I'm not healed. What's wrong with me? Or it leads to another distortion, that God lied to me. God said, ask and believe, and I didn't doubt, and he didn't give me what I wanted. And so therefore, God isn't trustworthy. And so one leads to self-condemnation, and the other leads to God-condemnation. And that's the distortions of this false gospel of name it and claim it. But then, let's say you ask for something, and you do get it. It can lead to another distortion, and that is I do get it, and therefore it leads to what I call a Christo-pagan thinking, a magical thinking, that God can be manipulated to do my will. So if I ask believing and ask really hard, and then it happens, then people start to have this magical thinking that I made God do what I wanted, and he gave me what I wanted, and that's just non-Christian thinking, and that leads to a distortion. It makes God less than God. But... There is the power of the aligned ask, and that is the prayer of expectation. Not some ritual prayer without hope, but a prayer that is expectant because it focuses in on the character of God. You know, a prayer that is aligned, an aligned ask means that faith is central. It's not how I'm feeling. It's not a method or pragmatism or a rationalization, but it's faith that is the focus. Now, faith is is not about faith in faith, but it's about faith in the God who is able. And then the means or the outcome becomes secondary when we have an aligned ask. So if my ask is aligned, the outcome is not the big issue. It's me aligning my heart with God, and that's the main thing. 
to ask according to His will. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, If we ask anything according to His will, we know that He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked of Him. And so, against the name and claimant of asking God for anything, the importance of the anything asked is to align our hearts with God, and then our request will be in alignment with His will, and he know, we know that He will give us what we ask for as we align our hearts. And this is difficult. Because sometimes we want things and we don't see the big picture. So the question is, are you more concerned about getting what you think you want than obeying the already revealed will of God? Because God has revealed a lot of His will for us. You see, obedience to the known is a critical step in discerning the yet to be revealed. As it demonstrates your trustworthiness with the treasures that God has already given you. You see... God has showed us some of his will. Will He wants us to walk in holiness. He has told us some things that clearly he wants all of us to do. And if we're not willing to walk in obedience for those things, how can we expect for him to give us discernment for the yet to be when we haven't shown ourselves to be trustworthy with the smallest of things? It's a stewardship issue. And this is so important for us to, to have faith in God and ha ask believing, but ask humbly and aligned with God. It's not faith in faith or faith how, how hard you believe, but it's in whom you believe, which is the vital issue that impacts us. And that leads us to the, 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 the short and final third point of this message, that Jesus continues with the fig tree lesson. He shows that biblical faith impacts conflicts and, and personal relationships, and that's the forgiveness factor. I'm only going to touch on it briefly, but I'll let you stew on it and meditate on it as we continue on. In verse 25, he says, And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. You see that biblical faith that I spent so much time talking about results in, in biblical forgiveness. A, a biblical faith is a forgiving faith. It's important to understand that that forgiveness is the true freedom. Because when we forgive others, we are not bound by bitterness over the wrongs that have been done against us. Forgiveness means foregoing the right to punish somebody legitimately for a wrong that has been done against you. And it keeps them from living rent-free in your head, having control over you. When you forgive, you remove the right of them to live in your mind when they're not even thinking about you. So there's freedom through forgiveness. Because forgiveness is freedom because it understands grace. When we've received so much, how can we not be, how can we be unforgiving towards others? It's understanding that we've received much, and so we need to give much. But it's also uh, an obligation and a choice. It's a moral obligation because he says he commands us to forgive. But we have a choice of whether we... Uh, Obey that commandment. Mercy triumphs over judgment, and it frees us from the bondage of bitterness. You see, God hates that double standard. The double standard, he speaks out against two sets of weights. And he doesn't want you to be bound up in bitterness and, and bondage, but he wants you to forgive others so that they don't hold perpetual sway over you. But there's also a second balance point on this, and that is that trust is not an obligation. If you've been wounded, if somebody's harmed you, your command is to love them. Your command is to forgive them. And yes, that can be very, very hard. But we are not commanded to trust. Because broken trust, it's hard but it can be restored, and healing can occur. But broken trust for healing to occur starts with repentance. A person must repent, and if you've hurt somebody, you must repent and turn away from that, that sin and hurt. But then it also involves following an intentional pathway, and that takes consistency over time. So we are not obliged to trust. As a matter of fact, sometimes we should be very careful and leery. But that doesn't mean that we remain, we say that but just because I can't trust that I remain unloving or unforgiving. No, we are commanded to love, we are commanded to forgive, but we are called to be prudent, and we don't just trust anybody and every, everybody. If you receive an email from a Nigerian princess, do not trust it. 
<laughs> saying, hey, I need your bank account information so I can give you millions of dollars. We should not trust uh, a lot of things. But the thing that we also need to understand is that, no, it doesn't always conclude the way that we might hope. You know, we do not have to succumb to hopelessness and despair and cynicism and isolation and bitterness and close-heartedness towards gods and others just because some things didn't work out the way we might have hoped because sometimes it's outside of our control. But the good news is, is that we can continue to love and be forgiving to others. And sometimes we need to establish boundaries and physical, for physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual safety. But we still need to love and we still need to forgive. Remember, the main idea of this passage, it's not about the figs, but the fruit we bear reveals the health of our being. And Jesus wants us to be healthy people so that we can be fruitful in this life. And so what's our next step? Is there an area of your life where the fruit you produce does not match the type of tree that you proclaim to be? Then allow yourself to be that person so that the fruit will be matching. Are you living in doubt or are you walking by faith? Because faith overcomes doubt and helps us to be fruitful. Are you seeking your own will or are you aligning your will to the Father? If you're aligning your will, then you have the right to ask and He will grant you according to what you ask because it's aligned with His will. Or are you harboring unforgiveness in your heart which is hindering you from fully experiencing the grace that God wants for you? Wherever you are, God has an action point for you. And if you've never trusted Jesus today, let this be the day where you come into that faith relationship with him and become born again and have a purpose that you can live into so that you can bear fruit for your glory. May you be the fruit of faith today if you've never made that decision. And if you have, walk forth with the good news of, so that you can bear the fruit of character, character transformation and be proclaiming the hope of Jesus to others. Let's pray.